Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the service of this church. Glad to see you all. Glad everybody's here. Some visitors, I'm sure. Visitors, we're delighted to have you, as always, in the case. Remind you just now, if you will, be sure and take a card out of the pew back there in front of you. If you're a visitor, well, if you're not a visitor, everybody, take a card out or fill it out. Let us know that we were here. We'd like to have a record of your attendance. Have a lot of announcements this evening, so bear with me just for a moment. Remind you of those who are sick, Carla Empson continues to wait to see her doctor. She will see her doctor this week, Tuesday, I believe. Tom Reeves is in the Calvert City Convalescent Center in room 213A for rehab. He will enjoy having visitors. Larry Spears in the Murray Calloway County Hospital, room 225-23, following hip replacement. Shauna Burkeen is scheduled to have surgery Wednesday at Lewis. She's expected to be in the hospital for a couple of days. This morning, we announced that Carla Marshall, former circuit clerk uh, here at St. Vince for Marshall County, had had a massive stroke, and she's in Lewis Hospital, and the family has had prayers uh, in her behalf. Also, uh, Van just gave me this announcement that 2 p.m. tomorrow on the NBC channel, on the Meredith Verena, if I said that right, show, his daughter Tori will be a guest on that show, and she will have with her her little sister, her little sorority sister, Alexis, who has Down syndrome. And Tori will be on the NBC show uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Tori's a fan of one of those babies. If you look at that and tune in, and she's one as she, as she uh, is on TV right now. I have also another announcement. The Young in Heart outing on Tuesday, October the 6th, for example, to Marion, Kentucky. Ride the ferry to Cave and Rock, do a tour of the park in, in southern Illinois, and join the beautiful fall colors. You'll end up at, at uh, for lunch at the 17th Street Barbecue in Marion, Illinois. The bus will leave the building at 8.30 a.m. and will return mid-afternoon. This is a trip you don't want to miss. Lunch will be provided. Sign up sheet is in the foyer on the bulletin board. If you have questions, see Bob or James. Now, this represents a change from the plan that was previously stated, but the reason for the change is because of the weather. So uh, this is the new itinerary, and if you could possibly make it, see, uh, see Bob or James. Any further announcements from anyone that I should know? Okay, if nothing else, please join us as we begin worship and praise. We'll start off with gentle liturgy. If you would please stand for the opening song, we'll sing verses 1 and 2. Number 112, One Prayer to Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, risen on the last day.
789 in the first day of Pesach. You should be able to email that, retrieve it. We'll sing number 789, and we'll have our opening prayer. Song of invitation at the uh, Mount Joy Springs collection, including that'll be number uh, 791 on bended knee. We'll sing both those 791. Will please stand once more before the uh, sermon, and at this time the children will be uh, dismissed to class. We'll sing number 745. Handel will uh, take one more verse.
Once again, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you to the elders for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you not only this morning, but speak to you tonight also. Also, I had several compliments tonight, and I'd like to say thank you for all of the, the compliments I had this morning also. So, so once again, I appreciate so much today. I appreciate being given the opportunity to speak in Mark's absence, and I just want to say thank you. As I said this morning, I've entitled our lesson tonight, Titus, the Almost Man. Now, why would we call Pilate the Almost Man? Simply because Pilate, as we saw in our lesson text tonight, Pilate almost released Jesus, but he didn't. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, a poet once, re- once wrote these words. He said, of all the words of tongue or pen, 
the fattest are weak in my opinion. You know, if that is true, then I would have to say that one of the most tragic words in all of human history must be the word almost. Now, if you go to the definition to look up the definition of almost, you're going to find these words. Very nearly. Almost. And I think we all understand easily what the word almost means. The word almost speaks of aborted opportunities. The word almost speaks of missed chances. And I'm sure that as long as this world exists, the word almost will dot the pages of human history. For example, words like, I almost climbed the mountain. We almost reached our goal. I almost closed the deal. We almost got there in time. And I would imagine that most of us can all think about those almost experiences we've always had in our lives. But as I said earlier, tonight we're going to talk about or what I think is the most famous almoster in all of history. And I think the most famous almoster in all of history would have to be Pilate that we read about in our lesson today. And again, the reason that I call him the most famous almoster is because he almost released Jesus. He almost lowered that gavel and said, not guilty. He almost said, I dismiss all charges against this man because he is innocent. You see, Pilate almost set Jesus free, but he didn't. But let's just imagine for a moment what a change in our perception, or maybe what a change our perception would be of Pilate. Let's just imagine for a moment if he had released Jesus, if he had let Jesus go, if he had pronounced him innocent of all charges and let Jesus go. What, should, what would be our perception of Pilate today? Can you imagine the deep respect we would have for him today if he had only released Jesus? You see, he almost released Jesus, but he didn't. Oh, yes, he could have. And, Mayor, that's a big part of the tragedy. He could have released Jesus. I mean, Pilate had the authority to do it. You see, he wore the signet ring that, that signified that he had the power to release Jesus. Pilate was the Roman governor in Palestine at that time. Pilate had all power. Pilate could basically do anything he wanted to do. And so when Jesus was standing before him, all Pilate had to do was speak the word decisively. And if he had done that, Jesus would have been set free. And he almost did that. Again, look there at verse 23 in our lesson text if you still have your Bibles there. Verse 23, and they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. You see, Pilate made the decision that he was going to listen to their voices. We could even say that maybe, I suppose that we could say that, that Pilate listened to the voices of evil. Pilate made the decision he was going to listen to the voices, voice of Satan. I want us today, we say that maybe on occasion we've heard those same voices. Have we oftentimes listened to the voices of evil? Have we listened to the voices of Satan? For example, that, that little voice that says, oh, go away from me. Nobody wants you here. Or maybe that, that, that little voice that whispers to you, oh, go ahead and take one little sip of this cup. You see, that's what the voice of Satan did to Jesus. 
Satan will beckon them to a path that we shouldn't go to. But we should never listen to the voice of the beast. Never listen to the voice of Satan. But now Pilate did not have to listen to those voices. I mean, there were other voices that that Pilate could have listened to. For example, Pilate could have listened to the, the voice of his wife. Remember how his wife sent him a note? We read that in in, in Matthew 27. You see, Pilate's wife got him a little bit tied up in this. Telling Pilate, don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I am? Matthew 27, 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that judgment? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream before thee. You see, Pilate could have listened to her voice, but he didn't. Not only her voice, Pilate even could have listened to his own voice. Now let's let's remember one thing about Pilate. Pilate was no fool. Pilate knew what was going on. We might today say that Pilate could see through this charade. He knew that that Annas and Caiaphas, the chief priests, he knew that they were corrupt. He knew that they were greedy. He, He knew that they were jealous of Jesus. You see, since Jesus had come on the scene, at some point Jesus began to draw most of the attention of the Jews away from the Jewish religious leaders. He was able to do that because of his teaching and because of his miracles. And so many of the the religious Jews began to gravitate toward Jesus and away from the Jewish religious leaders. That's one of the reasons they wanted to get rid of Jesus. They began to get jealous of Jesus. And so Pilate knew what was going on. He knew these things. He knew that they were lying about Jesus. And so Pilate, not only could he have listened to his wife's voice, he could have listened to his own voice. He could have listened to reason. He could have listened to common sense. And he almost did. But he didn't. You know, Pilate was not the only one who ever played the almost did game. You know, a lot of us have played that game. I don't know how many times I've heard someone come to me and say, you know, I almost made that decision. I'll spend time, weeks or months talking to people, and at some point they'll come up to me and say, you know, I'm almost there. I'm almost ready to take the invitation of Christ seriously. I'm almost ready to say, Lord, here I am. able to baptize one of my almost did. It was about four years ago when I baptized him. My goal was to baptize him. And I began talking to him, studying with him, trying to convince him he needed to get baptized. He was one of those one of the things that I always told him is I always told him, you know, there are no almost deaths. There is no almost deaths. 
There is no almost place that we can go. The Bible teaches that there's only two places. There's heaven and there's hell. And there's no other place. Everyone who has ever lived or will live is going to spend one day, is going to spend all of eternity in one of those two places. Anyway, when we open our Bibles, we begin to read the story of Jesus. And we read about the crucifixion. Now, even though Pilate came all that close to freeing Jesus, I mean, he almost did, but he didn't. And so, as we, maybe in our minds, as we begin to view the the crucifixion scene, now we talked about that scene. We talked about the trial of Jesus everything he went through in that trial, and then he went through the crucifixion. And so we talked about that this morning, but then let's just revisit that just a little bit again tonight. Try to picture the crucifixion scene in your mind. We see the Roman soldiers going about their duties. Now, remember, these were Roman soldiers. These are professional soldiers. They had had been used to crucify people Many, many times they were professionals. And so they had done this many, many times before. And what they would do at the crucifixion, they would lay the cross beam down on the ground. And so when Jesus' cross beam was on the ground, then they placed Jesus as well as the two thieves on either side of him. And they placed them down on the cross beam, and then they, they drive these large spikes through their hands and through their feet. And then once that they are nailed to that cross beam, then they, they, several of the soldiers pick up that, that heavy wooden cross beam that now has the weight of the prisoner on there, and they lift it up into the air. And then they position it over the hole in the ground that's been dug for the cross beam. And then when they have it right over that hole, they drop that cross beam down into the ground, and it, and it lands with a thud. And so they knew what they were doing. They had had done this thing before. They might have even drove some stakes into the ground around the cross and some confetti with it. But either way, when that beam is down in the hole, now Jesus is being crucified over here. Now you would think by now that Annas and Papa would have been satisfied. I mean, that's what they wanted all along. All this time, they wanted Jesus dead. And now Jesus is being crucified. He's hanging on that cross. And they're very close to that goal. They're very close to Jesus dying on the cross. That's what they wanted in the first place. You would think they would be happy. You'd think they'd be satisfied. Remember the sign that Pilate had placed on up above the head of, of Jesus? They were angry about that sign. You remember what the sign read, read and said? It said, Jesus, King of the Jews. And again, we mentioned this this morning. It was a common practice back then. Remember, Romans, Rome would not crucify their own soldiers. They said... They said crucifixion is too inhumane, too barbarian. We're not going to do that to our own citizens. But they would do it to Jesus. And so probably the vast majority of their crucifixion was with Jesus. That it violated Roman law. That it practiced insurrection. That practiced murder against Roman soldiers. And so what, what the Roman governor would do is he would put a sign up above the prisoner. That, that told the crime that he was found guilty of. And the whole purpose of that was to inform all the Jews. Now, crucifixions were always held in a very cosmopolitan place. They were always held on the main road. You would have a lot of Jews 
walking back and forth with me. You could always look up and see the preacher, the person being preached by. And then you could look up there and you could also see the crime that he had been found guilty of. And the whole point of that was for the Roman government to emphasize to the Jews, if you commit the crime that he committed, that's going to be you up there on that cross. And many times they would let the body stay up on the cross for days and, and weeks and the body would begin to rot. But that sign would be on there. But of course, we know that Jesus had not abided up there a Roman law. And so what was Pilate going to put on the sign? Well, he put on the sign, Jesus, King of Jews. You see, that was Pilate's way of making fun of the Jewish religious leaders. That was his way of making fun of the Jewish people. You know, he wasn't all that crazy about them anyway. But now the religious leaders had come to him and they had backed him into a spot and he had to do something and so he made the decision of Jesus crucified to placate all the Jewish religious leaders. So he said, I'm putting on the wrong sign. That's why he put that sign up there and said, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. In other words, Jews, here's your king hanging up here on the cross. I hope you like it. Again, the religious leaders not too happy with that. And so we see what they do is they, they, they storm into the presence of Pilate. And they go up to Pilate and they demand that he remove that sign. You see, that sign was offensive to the religious leaders. At this point, Pilate, and this is where the whole thing is headed, is at this point, Pilate got a little worried about it. They came up to him and they said, we want that sign down. And Pilate decides to become firm. Pilate is going to become decisive. Like I said, he's going to grow a backbone now. And he stands up to this, these religious leaders. I wish he had stood up to them when Jesus was there. But now he makes the decision he's going to stand up to them. And so when they come in, come rushing into him, protesting the wording on that sign, Pilate said, that's enough. He says, what I have written, I have written. Basically, Pilate tells them the crime is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that did this. And so he came to King Herod. looking through the blood running down his hands. You know, Jesus could look down and see the faces of the people that were gathered around him. Maybe for most of our lives, we're used to these pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross and we see him in the Bible style. But did you ever see the pictures where they were way up in the air? Many times when there was a crucifixion or death or whatever, they nailed it to the cross. But really with Jesus, they were nailing it to the cross. He was the cross. He was right there. And I would imagine many times at crucifixions there were large crowds. The reason for that is back then there were no football games. There were no soccer matches to watch them in. There were no baseball games to go to, no basketball games to attend. There were no golf courses. And so because of that, many times people would come to watch the crucifixion. And again, picturing that scene in your mind as we view that scene and, and, and look at their faces and the people that were there, I would imagine that at some point Jesus began to look for a friendly touch. I wonder if Jesus began to look for someone that he would recognize. I wonder if he began to look for his apostles. Remember what he had told his apostles. He had told them on several occasions, he says, now, I'm going to have to go into Jerusalem. And he says, by the hands of lawless men, I'm going to be put to death. But he said, in three days I'll arise. You remember when Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it back up. What was he talking about exactly? And so he had told the apostles on several occasions, I'm going to die for you people. I'm going to raise you up. And I wonder if Jesus began to look for some group of 
think surely Peter would have shown up. He did not show up. As a matter of fact, we know that Peter had to leave the house pretty quick because he had to go to the temple. James was not there. Andrew's not there. Bartholomew's not there. Basically, the candles were lit. And I sometimes wonder that when we look at those days, it didn't look like it did in our day. I mean, those soldiers were so close to one another. And sometimes today, as we look at those days, it almost seems like that. Maybe we could even be standing there looking up at them, and yet it was just you see, those soldiers were right there next to the cross. They could look up and see Jesus. If he said something, they could hear what he said. They were sitting down there on the ground right next to the spot where probably when blood would drip off of the body of Jesus, it would fall to the ground, maybe even fall right next to them. And I'm sure that when Jesus groaned because of pain, they could hear that. And at any time, they could look up and and they could see Jesus hanging on the cross and he's dying. And yet all the while, their minds were so close. We might say so close, yet so far. You see, they were right there next to the cross, but it was incredibly different than what it is today. They're gambling, simply trying to see who could get as drunk. At some point, Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. Lord, they don't know what they're doing. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. But go beg them to come to me. Father, forgive Pilate who found me innocent but sentenced me to death in prison. Father, forgive Annas and, and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and all the rest of the Jews that insisted that I die a martyr's death. Or maybe he was even saying, Father, forgive those Christians who were demeaning me so poorly and yet you found them innocent. Because their sometimes today we have problems getting along with our neighbors. Sometimes today we have problems forgiving our spouse. Sometimes we have problems forgiving our children. Maybe even we have trouble forgiving our brothers and sisters in Christ, in the church. But Jesus called us to say, Father, forgive them as we forgive those who sin against us. And the gospel tells us that Jesus told the devil to come out of the man. When he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And then Jesus turned to one of the thieves and said, Get up, you shall be with me. At one point, Jesus looked down at Mary, his mother, and then he turned and looked at John, the apostle, and said, Woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. Because the Bible says that suddenly darkness fell on the earth. And the winds began to blow, and lightning and thunder began to roll across the sky, and even the, the ground began to shake. And when that storm was at its height, Jesus said the words, Eli, Eli, lamach sabachthani. And there were those who kind of stood off in the distance and, and they could barely hear what Jesus had said. And so some people heard Jesus. He, he said something, but they didn't know what it was. And so they were saying, what did he just say? There were
were some that that heard him, but they they weren't sure what he said, and and so they said, well, may I think he I think he called for Elisha. Let's all stand back and see if Elisha comes down and rescues us. eventually two more tribes came to him. He said, I can help you. And then he said, it is enough. And then lastly, he said, now that you hear me, go in peace. You see, the greatest victory in all the world because on that hill that looked like a that old hill just outside the old city walls of Jerusalem. It was at that moment that everything that God had worked for, everything that God had planned, was finally realized with the death, burial, and ultimate resurrection of the Son of God. You know, the about life than the fact that we have a Savior. I've come today to say that life is kind of like a toss coin. You stick your fork in it and you never know for sure what you're going to get. I think we all could probably be familiar with the old song, The Good Times and the Bad Times. to say life is like a roller coaster. It has its ups and downs and its twists and turns and you really never know what you're going to get. I never tell you what I'm going to get. There's one very small but I think perhaps the most important thing that I've learned in my life. And that is that no matter what happens, God is going to be there for you. You see, God can take all of the inconsistencies of life He can take all of the fragments and pieces of our life and he can weave all of those together into one beautiful tapestry just like he wants to. And brethren, that's what he's called to do in our lives as well. Because you see, one day the sun will come and he may say, I have done enough. One one day we think everything is going our way One day everything is going great, and the next day we find ourselves our world is going to hell. You know, one minute you're you're young and you're healthy and happy, and the next day the doctor calls and says, Well, Mr. Smith, you have cancer. takes us back to this year in Desert Camp. Everything was normal like always. He was running and jumping and doing his miracle here and there. He was always there. And I'm talking to him. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I've got to go do this. I've got to go do that. I always get this low on him. I said, where can I talk to you? And that was April the 12th. The next day, April the 12th, his mother called me. Dad, I, 
found that in the fact that the Lord is not the only one that can do this. I just want to make some slides here for you. Let's look at Luke. Sunday the 15th, and then Monday the 16th, we were all up there worshiping the Lord. I had always thought that worship of the Lord was about singing, but you know we all had to sing to get there, so we got to praise God and thank Him for His goodness, and I think that was really my first experience of what it was like to be immersed in that worship. he said if you're going to be a Christian if you're going to have the right attitude if you're going to live for him the body suffers but if you're going to have the soul suffer you're going to be able to have peace in your heart as we close tonight I'm going to take us all through the cross and we're going to see what it means to us I came across a little prayer that was quite goes this way. O oh God, Almighty God, help us never, ever look at the cross and see the one who died without feeling the cross of his blood, without feeling our hearts strained to meet his love. Let us never come there, Lord, with a casual look at the cross, but almost be moved by it. Let's sing a song of worship. is that invariably there are always going to be people who are drawn to the cross of Christ. There are going to be people that are standing right on the brink of saying, I surrender, I give my life to you. They're going to be right there almost ready to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. They're so engrossed in what they're doing, so involved in their circumstances, so involved in their lives today, that they're just like those soldiers. They never look up and allow the message to sink in. They're so close yet so far, but they don't make a stand. They're just like those soldiers captured by the Pharisees. I'm praying tonight that this 
endure all kinds of things. And I pray tonight that we won't be in that situation. Man, that is so sad. But it's not sad tonight that we can live in his grace. His grace that is in the face of our sin. His grace patient with us. times today, Mike, you said thank you to the elders of your congregation for your trust. I sincerely believe that as we would to say thanks to you for helping us bring these outstanding messages to us, and I know we all have plenty of all modes that are possible, and I hope that this message will move us off of the all modes and into the action mode when it comes to talking to our neighbors and to others about the Lord through the Southern Compact. Marvelous lesson. Thank you so much for your help. We did have the opportunity, the chance to take the Lord's Supper for folk this morning. That was at the Presbyterian Community Foyer in the back of the library. Uh, if you turn into the second to the left to the left over there, turn left to Fleming Street, and you have the opportunity to uh, go in after the foyer and uh, partake of the Lord's Supper and uh, introduce us to the Southern Compact. It's a unique thing for our state and our church.